All right, good evening from Chicago, Illinois. It's Lucy Gray again with my technology and education class 575. And we're honored to have Martin Levins here tonight from Australia. Um, um, and it's noon his time the following day. This is it's seven o'clock where we are on a Wednesday evening and it's noon ish uh, Thursday um, in Australia. So that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, we're, Martin, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your storied career so we know where you're coming from. Okie dokie. I, I started, uh, I took a rather, I guess you might call it a, um, a scenic route to my degree um, after school because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. This is going back a long way, I might add, um, and fell into teaching because I figured it was a nice thing to do. Um, I didn't like a lot of other things that were offered to me and got offered a job in a Catholic school in Sydney for a year to try it out and see what I thought. Um, I suppose their, their aim there was to actually reduce their costs because they didn't have to pay me much. But anyway, um, I then decided it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. So I'd move on and uh, continue my degree, which again took a few more years. But I ended up um, teaching, um, enjoyed it very well, started as a um, science teacher. Uh, ended up as a, you know, over a course of um, 42 years of teaching, I ended up teaching science, mathematics, um, the heavier sciences like the physics, biology, um, chemistry. I taught geography, I taught English, I taught pretty much everything except religion, which was probably a wise move on their part. Um, I didn't teach music or any of those specialist subjects along those lines. I did teach design and technology, which I don't think you have in the US. Um, in the US and in Australia, um, there was a thing called woodworking and metalworking, which you guys called shop. Um, and we had that for quite some time. But that changed about 15 years ago where a new curriculum came out in my state anyway, because at that stage it was all state-based curriculum. Um, come to think of it, it was closer to 20 years ago now, but anyway, uh, called Design and Technology, and it was made mandatory for all kids in year seven and eight, and then optional for nine and 10. And this introduced this new component called design um, and the use of technology, and it considered wood and metal, but also plastics, um, computers, uh, all those things as materials and you tried to manufacture something to solve a problem. This went from fairly simplistic things in year seven and year eight up to, you could do this to the um, senior years. So in year 12, you're 18 years old, you could have a major project that you are designing and some of the stuff that the kids came up with was amazing. Some of it wasn't because they just thought it was woodwork and they didn't get the idea that you had to ideate and go through the process of thinking about what you did. No one likes revising what they've done. Um, but that course I taught for two or three years. I then went uh, back to teaching computing in year nine and 10. And then the last two years of my teaching, I was lucky enough to teach in year four and five. Uh, IT and computing as well. The teachers there wanted me to teach the kids how to code because that's the thing now. Apparently everyone has to be able to code. Um, so, but I enjoyed it by getting the kids to build games for, for younger kids. So I did a rather interesting experiment. I got the year nine, 10 kids to do, to do the same problems as the year four kids they had. So what we were using was Scratch, which a number of you may be familiar with, that thing from MIT on programming. Um, you know, the little cat that wanders around. And we used a thing called a Pico board, which is one of the very early things that could connect to computers. Nowadays, you'd use something like a Makey Makey. But the Pico board had a analog input as well as digital. So in other words, either the key's pressed or it's not. It had a continuously varying input that you could get from it. And I should dig one out in a minute, which I can if anyone's interested. And one of the things it had on it was a slider. And I got the kids in year four and in year nine to use the input from the slider to drive the paddle in a game of Pong. 
forward and back. And what I discovered was that the kids in year nine, 10 told me that it wasn't possible because the numbers that came out of the PICO board for the slider went from zero to a hundred, but the numbers that you needed on scratch for the uh, game, Pong, had to go from minus 200 to plus 200. And I said, well, okay, we have to take the, whatever the PICO board's giving us and modify it so that it creates those numbers. Year nine, 10 told me it was impossible. Year four, scratched their head and said, there's got to be a way of doing this, which I thought was fabulous. And they solved the problem, which was really, really good. In talking to a mate of mine who teaches at the university um, recently, who teaches signal conditioning for a whole bunch of different things, astronomical uh, research for human performance measurements, of, you know, monitors and sensors and stuff, through to what we're referring to here as a smart farm, where you measure a whole bunch of different things using sensors to inform the farmer's decision as to what to do next. And he said he has exactly the same problem with first year signal conditioning students because they have no idea how to take one set of numbers and convert it into another. So that's really interesting because that's actually the point of year nine, year eight and year nine mathematics, at least in New South Wales it was. So basically I did a little bit of work on this and asked the kids what the problem was and what they understood subtraction and addition to be and multiplication and division is some way of calculating how much change you were going to get at McDonald's. That was the only reason that they saw it existed. Um, and of course, you don't need to know that now because the computer calculates it anyway. So that's why they saw this thing as impossible. You can't take it from, you can't change a set of numbers from one set to another. You can't modify a set of numbers. Now I extended that a little bit further by, um, uh, taking another group of kids in the primary school and walking into their class one day and saying, this is Scratch. You all got it on your computers because we use the offline version so we don't have to worry about networking stuff. You've all got it on your computers. Uh, open it up and I put on the projector board. This is how it works. You've got an actor. You've got a cat, but you can change that. You'll work out how. You've got a, a stage on which that actor performs what you tell it to do they're called scripts uh, you can change the actor's costume and you can change the background see what you can do so it was a sort of uh, Sugata Mitra moment um, and I'm not too sure whether everyone's heard of him but he's an Indian guy now working out of England on the Soul project which is I don't know what it stands for now but it, it's basically it it's based on the hole in the wall project that he carried out in Calcutta I think it was or Delhi was, I'm sorry, Delhi, where he, his university was in the middle of a slum with a very large wall around it. The wall was around the university, although I suppose it could also be perceived as being around the slum, so it doesn't really matter. So he's got this big wall around this thing, and he punched a hole in that wall and put a computer in there, running Windows 3 or 95 or something, I can't remember, it was quite a while ago. Uh, powered it persistently, put a keyboard and a mouse out there, and just left it. And every now and then he'd check back to see what had happened. And he was able to remotely get into it and see what kids had been doing with it. And the remarkable number of kids who were asking the most amazing questions using search engines. And of course the search engine was interesting because it was all in English and they didn't know English. So they had to learn English to use it. And then they had to learn how to type to use it. They had to learn how to construct words is really what I'm after. So it wasn't just oral English to get their answers out. And he did much the same sort of thing as I did with a class, although really I did much the same thing as him. I'm not trying to take his, his ammunition, um, where he walked in with a bunch of kids and just said to them, I wonder if there's any relationship between DNA and the ability to catch a disease. I'll check back with you in six weeks and walk out. And this goes very much towards, you were talking about Steger earlier on, and, and Steger says that a good prompt is worth a thousand words. And if you can hit the kids with something that's, that, what? All of a sudden you've piqued their interest and then off they go. 
Uh, here, here's a question for you. I'm going to stop you for a second. Do you think that applies to adults too, or just kids? I think it applies to kids more than adults. I think it should apply to adults. Yeah. But adults have more of a fixed mindset where they, you know, we're designing a workshop at the moment for this project that I'm involved in, and it's a workshop for teachers on what different sorts of thinking skills are. You've got systems thinking, computational thinking, creative thinking, design thinking, um, how to project manage or how to help kids manage their projects. A little bit about PBL and CBL, not much, just referencing it. And then how to do some basic programming using Scratch, or but then going on to Python and the rest, just showing them where to go, not doing it. This is all in one day, I might add. And then doing some physical computing where we hook in things like Makey Makeys and BBC Microbits, um, and they get to fiddle with them and play with them. And when we looked at this, he said, this is all, you know, step one, step two, step three sort of business. It's, it's not what we want to see in a classroom. But I think we have to write it in such a way that those who need the step one, step two, step three have got it. But those that don't can jump ahead and do whatever they want to do. Um, that's Bingo. about the... Yeah. Um, that's what we've been sad, talking about in our class. I mean, I, th I think we're, you know, uh, we've been talking about adult learning, which I didn't know the formal name until I taught this class was Adrogogi. Andro Androgogi, I can't even pronounce it. Um, Androgogi, yeah. Uh, but, the, but the principles of adult learning and how do we differentiate for adults? Because I think that's completely lacking in a lot of professional development. So this is like really interesting. Like, do, do the same things apply to kids? You know, as Sugatra. You know, I was just looking at his Wikipedia entry, and he believes in he's part of the minimal education movement mm -hmm. or something. There's some term for it. What he believes in. Um, he's best known for Home the Wall, and they said minimally invasive education is the is the term that they use so is there minimally invasive pd you know um I, I i just think this is kind of interesting where you're going with this and um anyway keep going i just wanted to ask you if you thought adults were capable of learning in this way or being self-directed enough i think they are but adults have got pressures on them that students don't just trying to get rid of that flare out the back there uh, adults have got pressures on them that students don't. You know, teachers have got an enormous workload, despite what people say. And if they're going to do their job correctly, um, they're working flat out. And to tell them that they've got to teach another subject or that they have to do things a different way just says, you know, look, I just got used to driving the diesel. Now you want to put me in an electric car, you know. Even though the difference may not be so huge, the issue is that it is perceived as a difference and then they close their mind and say, it's too big a difference, I can't cope. I need professional development in how to do that. And we're getting that a lot with teachers in the project that I'm involved with at the moment who say things like, well, if you're gonna put give every kid an iPad and give me an iPad, I need professional development in how to use an iPad. And I said, look, just go find a two-year-old. They'll help you. You know, it's not hard. Um, it, it, as we get older, our, our ideas become more and more in fix, fixed so that something as simple as having to swipe to do something or click on something, you know, you'd remember this, Lucy, back when, the, when hypertext links first came out. And you still see people doing this. They double click on a high tap text link. You know, why are you doing that? Oh, to open it. Well, you don't have to. You just click. Oh yeah. So those things carry on for quite a long time, and I think we have to realise that because I, I do exactly the same thing as part of this new job that I've got. They've given me a um, a Mac which has got uh, Windows uh, 10 running on it, and we have to use SharePoint. Uh, to share everything, but every single one of us has gone off and, and we're only using the Mac side, we're not using the PC side. And the only reason they've got to have PC on it because they need to control it. 
from the uh, internals. They need to be able to update it and change our password. I haven't heard anybody installing second. Windows anymore on a Mac. I know you can <sighs> do it, but that, that was one of the, the great things about OS X when it first came out, right? But like, mm. I haven't heard of anybody still using it and going back and forth. That's so funny. Well, you, can't, you, you can control Macs. Uh, in the same way as you can control PCs. But you can find a, uh, a person with those skills in the Windows world on every street corner. You, they're very rare in the Mac world. But anyway, everyone's gone off that. They're using Google Drive just because it's, it, it doesn't impede your flow, um, you know? So I'm, I'm looking at that and saying, okay, I'm a teacher and I've just been told that I have to do things in a different way. You're effectively in that same position. So what is your objection and why are you objecting to do that? And what, what is the block that's stopping you from doing that? And the block that's stopping me from doing it is that it takes twice as long to do something as it does on the other end. And a teacher is not going to wear that. Uh, they just don't have time to do it. So we have to come up with ways of making it uh, relatively simple. I think we have to come up with ways of making it available so our workshops now are step by step but they will be given the workbooks will be given in digital and paper format we still give things out in paper format i might add we're giving things out in paper format but the um the the workshop will run uh the facilitator will have a, just a couple of things on on the screen saying this is what we're going to look at next and it'll just be ad hoc throughout the classroom. If you want to follow this through step by step, it's there for you. Uh, if you reckon, yeah, I've got that, got that, mm, that looks interesting, that's fine too. Uh, if you're really bored with that, no, nah, I've done that so many times, do something really cool and impress your neighbour and see what happens uh, in that regard and perhaps think about whether or not you could use that as an assessment technique. Oh, I love that. So tell us more about what you're designing right now, who the audience is and who you're working for and and what the what your what kind of professional development goals are you trying to meet? Okay, so we've got um, a new curriculum in Australia called the Australian Curriculum. It took them hours to come up with that, um, and it's a curriculum in English, mathematics, science, um, the social sciences, geography, um, technology, in that design and technology sense that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and now we've got a new one called Digital Technologies. Um, and that is a really interesting one because it's actually computer science. So that's mandatory for every kid from kindergarten through to year eight. It's optional from eight onwards. So of course you've got a whole bunch of kindergarten teachers freaking as I say, I can't teach um, computer science. I have no idea, I've never been taught I need professional development. So what we're trying to do is to show them how this can be incorporated into what they already do. So um, each of the school which is in this project that I'm working with, and I should describe what the project is, I suppose, at some stage. Um, the project is a, a thing called the Digital Technologies in Focus project. It's funded through a $7 million grant from the um, Australian uh, Federal Government. Um, it involves um, one project lead who works for a mob called ACARA, which is the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, which is owned by every state. It's a um, federal authority, but it's owned by every state. Um, and nine other curriculum officers, of which I'm one. We had 150 schools um, who have been invited, 160 schools who have been invited into this, and the way that they got an invitation was on a proportional basis, depending upon whether they were a state school, whether they were a Catholic school, or whether they were an independent school. In Australia, we make those two distinctions. Catholic schools are Catholic schools, and independent is Anglican and you know Califumpian and um, people who believe in plates of gold on the ground and all, all, all sorts of stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> California so, me. Um, yeah, anyone. So, but they also had to have a socioeconomic standing um, of less than a certain number, which put them way below the average within Australia. So the idea is if you can do it with these guys, you can do it with anyone. And that's, that's a tough call because we've only got 
two and a half years to achieve this and we want something that's going to be sustainable. And often in these schools, they are low socioeconomic status because they're rural or remote and teacher changes are frequent and voluminous. You know, one of my, teach one of my uh, principals this year had 70% of his staff change. And on the day before school started, he still didn't know who he was getting as teachers. So there's some significant stuff there. One of the other schools in the Northern Territory, which is right up the north of Australia, um, as the name would suggest, um, had last year, it was nine teachers. This year they got three. And they're trying to cope with that. That's all the government is funding them for. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. Anyway, they're the schools that we're working with. So they're the target audience, but we're inviting other schools who want to come along to that as well, if they wish. And the target, the way that we're, what we're trying to do is to do three distinct workshops. One is, what the hell does this curriculum mean? Let's unpack it and let's see what the words mean and how we might use this and blah, blah, blah. The other one is, how can you develop this across the entire school? And then the third one is this one that I'm involved in, which is called customization, which I just described. Um, <clears throat> we're quality assuring those uh, workshops at the end of this month, and then we'll be giving them over the six months, I suppose, throughout Australia, which should be quite interesting. Particularly just... with one of the schools that I've got in the Northern Territory where the school building is a mango tree. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So will you be the delivery mechanism or will there be other people delivering them? Uh, there'll be a couple of us delivering okay. them. Yeah. Okay. Because I just, I just put the links to the curriculum that you mentioned and to the ACARA group. In the, okay. Thank so you. We've got that so people can look at that. Um, so I've just put up a, um, a paper from a lady called Margaret Lloyd and another lady called Janet Cochran called Celtic Knots interweaving the elements and they're the elements of professional development. They did quite a seminal study back in 2012, I think it was, or 2013, on what has worked in professional development and what hasn't worked. Oh, um, so that's, that's a worthwhile thing to look at. Yeah, it seems like, um, you know, when I've designed stuff, I still struggle with this. I mean, sometimes stuff that I design works really well and other times it's, it, it's not great. And I feel like I've, um, like I haven't, like I've missed something or I've missed the needs of the teachers or whatever. And the other thing I've also struggled with is I feel like this compelling need to provide everybody with 5 million links and resources so they feel like they've got <laughs> value out of whatever I'm doing. And, yeah. um, and I found that sometimes this going with the flow it's okay. And giving some people some, some room to play and to go off in their different paths. Um, here's a perfect example. At FETC, I did, with Karen Blumberg, who you know, I did a big workshop. We didn't know, realize how many people we were going to have on it on, on social media and schools. And it was this huge room with all these people, and it was not what we had expected to teach. And it really wasn't the right setting for us and it was probably too much for the people and maybe didn't match what they expected. Um, the next day I did a workshop for three people or six people on iTunes and iTunes U and exploring that. And because we were all small group, because I checked in with this group and said, what are you, this is what we're doing. Are you okay with that? Is that what you're expecting to get out of this? And they were like, yeah. Um, it ended up being this really lovely, uh, sharing and and communal event and then um, and then the third one was more kind of you know throw stuff at people in a presentation mode but that's what they were there for and that went fine but it was it was so interesting to me like maybe I sh maybe there's something is over such a, there maybe there's something is is, is over planning and over structurizing mm -hmm. PE and letting teachers have some choice in it um, so this is interesting to me that you, you, you develop the different ways for people to go and you don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. I don't know. You, you feel that you've got a responsibility to pass on a whole bunch of knowledge Yeah. that often what you end up doing is compromising anything. Um, you know, everything I should say. There's a, a mate of, um, she's a mate of Gary Stagers, I think. 
who says that the best thing that we can do with curriculum is to get rid of half of it. And it doesn't really matter which half. And I'm firmly in that view. We have a mathematics curriculum in um, New South Wales that is just nightmarish. You know, if it's Tuesday, we're doing coordinate geometry. If it's Wednesday, we're doing something else. So the kids just get to dip into something. They never get the chance to actually explore anything in depth because someone has decided that every single one of these is really important. Rather than have kids play with stuff, and to get back to that little, I'll put a link up for this in a minute, but to get back to that story I was telling earlier on, when I walked back into that classroom that I did the Sagata Mitra thing with, I said to a couple of the kids, show me what you got. And they sat down and they showed me what they were working on and how it was going and blah, blah, blah. And I just turned my phone on, had it sitting behind them. So we didn't see anyone's faces. So that was all cool. And got them to talk to me and I just asked them questions. It was an amazingly rich experience. Um, so there's about four and a half minutes. It's worth watching. It's on YouTube. I'll put the link up in a sec. But the thing that really struck me was that this kid said, and you'll look for this in the video, I said, you've got scores on your screen, you know, scores for the battleship and scores for the helicopter or whatever it was. Somehow or other, a helicopter could battle a destroyer. Anyway. Um, and he said, yeah. And I said, how did you do that? And he said, um, I used the variable. And then he went on to talk about something else. Huh? What's he on about? And he said, tell me more about this variable thing. And he says, oh, yeah, it's a variable. Um, and, and you can use it for anything. You just put stuff there. And you don't even know what's there sometimes, but then you pull it out later when you need to use it. Uh, that's a brilliant description of, an, of a variable. <laughs> yeah. So then I started to go through his um, through the video that I took of him and checked off what he had achieved. And he had demonstrated mastery of 25% of the year seven mathematics syllabus in 10 days on his own. Well, not quite on his own, because I said to him, how did you find out about the variables? Did you read it somewhere? Or variables, sorry, did you read it somewhere? And uh, he said, no, no, Marcus told me. And then you hear Marcus in the background say, no, 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 it was Chris or someone else. And then Chris said, no, you told me. It didn't matter. The, the fact was that they were collaborating, but not in the sense that we normally talk about collaboration, where people, you know, one person gets to write and the other person gets to talk but uh, a true collaboration where people are trying to solve a common problem that is of value to them and they share what they do, which is basically the open source movement, really, when you think about it. Um, but it was fantastic, really, really good. So I'll put that link up in a minute. And the other thing that's worthwhile looking at, which I'll put up as well for you um, into this chat in a little while, is the Australian Curriculum Cube which it, the curriculum is not just mathematics, science, or they're all called learning areas, but there is also a thing called general capabilities. And ICT is one of the general capabilities. And one of the biggest difficulties we have to explain to people is the difference between ICT and IT. So ICT says, you know, one of the schools I was talking to, what are you going to do as your project? Well, we've got a garden. Okay, okay good. And the kids grow stuff. Okay, good. So primary school. Um, so what are you going to do with it? Well, we think we'll measure how high the plants are and put that into Excel and see how high the plants are growing. Okay, right. That's ICT general capabilities. That's not digital technologies. We have to do something a little bit different to that. Because basically, you know, you know how big the plants are. You can see the bloody things. So um, the, the next step that we did with them is, okay, how about we get the kids to design a solution to watering the plants? Because that's a problem. Who waters it during vacation? Who waters it over the weekend? Who monitors whether or not it needs watering or not? And one of the schools, which was lovely, said to me, we don't need a digital technologies um, solution for that. And I said, why is that? And she said, we've got Mrs. Jones. Who's Mrs. Jones? And she lives across the road from the school. She comes across and waters the gardens for the kids. So okay, that's cool. But let's get the kids to do a, a risk-benefit analysis on whether that is going to work everywhere. What happens if Mrs. Jones gets sick? 
What happens if she goes on holidays? Does she appoint new one? Does she just come across some water irrespective of whether it needs watering? You know, let's think about this in the bigger terms. So we've got them on side to getting the kids to develop their own moisture sensors, uh, hooking that up to a BBC micro bit and programming the BBC micro bit that if there's sufficient water, it prints out a heart on the side. And if there's insufficient water, it presses, a, it does a cross or a, I don't know, a smiley frown or whatever they want to do. Um, and then when it gets into the older years, we'll get the kids to say, okay, that's still got a human element in it and it's still got a problem. Someone has to notice that it needs water and then water it. Um, we need a better way of doing this. So what I'm experimenting with now is rather than printing out a heart, we use something like that, which is a little relay, which turns on a pump, which I've got over there. And they can set this up in the laboratory and test it. So when it gets too dry, it waters until it gets sufficiently watered and then turns the pump off. Oh. And then we can start to look at, you know, water usage and costs and sustainability and a whole heap of things that suddenly get asked about that. So how old um, are the kids? Year five, year six. Okay, so, so, that's, so that's 11, good. 12. Yeah, that's about the same with us. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing what kids can do if you put it to them, but that, that's a really intellectually rigorous problem and that can go in all sorts of directions. And if you don't have a teacher that's capable of, the, of thinking like the different directions we could go in, then that's a problem. Exactly. Uh, so if the teacher wants to sit where they are and not change anything, anytime, for any reason, you know, maybe it's time you looked in the classifieds. Um, is no one's going to be interested? Um, one of some of the work that's been done on um, in South Australia, and I'm going to put this link up um, at the moment for you, is on a thing called the Digital Hub, um, Digital Technologies Hub. And that's a, a federal government uh, funded thing, again, through Education Services Australia. And it's got set up how to look at digital technologies from the perspective of teachers, students, school leaders, and families. So let me just paste that into the thingamajig here. And in there, there's some really, really interesting uh, work that's been done by videoing teachers in very young classes or teachers of very young classes talking to them about how they introduce the concept of algorithms into their teaching in year two. Now, most people say, you know, algo what? That's fair enough. Never heard of it before. Um, but algorithms is basically a recipe. And once it was pointed out to these guys that they are already doing um, uh, this work by getting the kids to make cakes, which is one of the things that they had to do, which they saw as a, an instruction following exercise, the, the fact that they could use this to satisfy the requirements for algorithms changed their perspective altogether. But the really interesting thing is that the leadership, the principal from the leadership, and I'll put this link up in a minute, said it was very scary giving the kids some control. We were very worried that their cakes weren't going to turn out well. And then, you know, when you ask them the exercise, is the exercise to get a good cake or is the exercise to see how well that algorithm has been followed? And if the kids have this as an algorithm rather than just a, a, bun a pasted bunch of stuff that says do this, do that, take two eggs, add to the flour, doesn't say that you've got to crack the eggs. And so break it down into single steps and then get the kids to identify if there are any problems, where the problem might have been, modify it, go back and try it again. That takes twice as long, but you get twice as deep learning, or, you know, much deeper learning than that, actually. Um, and that's a, a worthwhile thing to have a look at. Um, Can I ask trying... you, uh, in, in general, what's, I know this is a really broad topic, but what is, what is typically staff development like in Australian schools? Is there a lot of it on everything? 
is there some, is it, is it, um, it doesn't really depend on what kind of school you're at. I'm sure it does. Uh, and then when it comes to ICT or digital technologies, professional development, what does that look like as a whole? Is it still kind of emerging? I mean, my impression from, uh, here's, uh, my impression of Australian educators is A, everyone I've, I've met from there seems to have a pretty deep understanding of, ped of pedagogy. Like the, the pedagogical practices are, are, are first and foremost. And then the second piece is it seems like you guys are pretty tech savvy, but I could be wrong on that. So I'm no, just I think what it's like in general. Yeah, no, I think that's a good uh, description. In fact, visiting ISTE is very affirmative because you see, wow, these guys are still doing that, you know, or that they haven't progressed beyond that, or I haven't seen anything here that is really, um, you know, blowing me away. Um, I, I'm seeing stuff that is, yeah, okay. Most, most schools in Australia would be doing something like that. And uh, that a lot of the schools are tech savvy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of teachers. There's an issue with equipment. There's an issue with um, support. You know, one of the biggest ways you can turn off a teacher from using any technology in their teaching for whatever reason will be that it fails. And then they say to you, I was working with some schools in Queensland last year who said only six kids in my class could connect to the internet uh, using their equipment, so I had to suddenly use a different lesson. I'm not preparing two lesson plans, so I just told them never to bring their computers to school again, because that school had no support, and it had uh, for 1,200 kids and 300 staff a 50 megabit per second connection, and that's just insane. Uh, it's way too low for the sort of support that you want particularly when everyone lets their devices up, update when they get to school so they don't use their home data, <laughs> those sorts of things. Um, so apart from that, um, there is a fair degree of support through our computer education groups, our state-based groups, um, which exist throughout, uh, like FETC or FET, uh, like the Texas mob, like the New York State, um, we've got one of those in each state or territory in Australia, and they're reasonably active. Um, they have a reasonable uh, membership. But the transition that we are noticing that's difficult is that a lot of... It's changed now that you can't escape and say someone else has got to teach that. Because every kid from year K, from kindergarten up to year eight, has to do this. Not a great number of hours, but they have to demonstrate that they're doing it. So there's a lot of um, flurry at the moment uh, in different states, depending upon the stage of implementation that they're at. Tasmania has decided that, no, they're not going to implement in 2018 anymore or even 2019. They're going to delay it in 2020. And the sad thing about that is they didn't say that they're going to introduce additional support for teachers in those two intervening years. They were just going to delay it. And that meant the teachers said, oh, thank God for that, we don't have to do anything for another two years. And then they'll be in exactly the same position again in 2019 with an impending release in 2020. Um, what I've noticed, though, in finding all of the school and talking to teachers in all of the schools, and it doesn't matter which country you're in, they are passionate about the kids. And if you can show them a convincing argument as to why this is going to improve their teaching, they'll adopt it. You know, they've adopted all sorts of things before, which didn't seemingly make any sense, but they have. Um, and they've gone away and they've learned how to do it and they've deployed it and they've done extra work because they were told that this would improve the, benefit, the um, work of the kids. And that's one of the big um, problems is evidence-based um, research in education is is fairly tenuous I think a lot of it tries to be professional and scientific but it's very difficult to control variables or variables in um, in any educational research I think you're uh, probably a little bit ahead of us because you have a national curriculum 
like maybe your different states are at different adoption points, but you have something that you've agreed upon and you're not fighting about it. Whereas here, uh, I don't know why, you know, everything's done at the state level. Common Core was supposed to be an attempt at a national curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. And is really fallen by the way, the, the, the side of things. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of states have refused to go along with it now. Um, yeah. And I don't think Common Core is that evil. I think it's the interpretation of it that hasn't been great. And, and so that was just for, for, EL, for English language arts and for math. And, you know, we haven't even gotten to the, to the IC, to the technical stuff. The, the interesting thing about the ISTE standards here is that I think they're very few people that have, um, not few, but I think it's very, uh, I don't know if every school has looked at the ISTE standards and takes them seriously and really tries to do something around them. For, for kids, for educators, for administrators, I, I think it's, um, they're looked at as, oh, those are nice and those are, those are optional, but uh, I'm not so sure everybody is, is taking them really seriously. Yeah, I, I had this issue, and it relates back to the earlier part of this discussion, as to whether something should be compulsory or not. And when you get Stager on next week, he's going to say, damn all curriculum, curriculum is the enemy of everything. And to a certain extent, he's right. But there's also the accountability side of things that says we're putting X million dollars into education. Um, I don't think this is the right way of viewing things, by the way, but it's still something that we need to deal with what are we seeing as the benefit if we double the funding to education are we going to see double in benefits and then you start to say well you know what are you going to perceive as a benefit um are you going to get kids who move up a scale in reading ability is that a benefit that's really worthwhile spending all that money on um i love the idea that the Finns have uh and interestingly parsi whatever his name is uh is now working in Australia, who's the previous um, Minister for Education in Finland. And a lot of this is cultural as well. Um, in Finland, teachers are almost revered with the same level of trust as doctors. Um, they're not done that way here, or in America, I would suggest, in the US. Um, and the state, this country, I'm sorry, puts out a curriculum and says, this is what you should be doing. But how you implement that is up to you. You decide how to do that because you know what your local environment is like. You know what your kids are. You know where they're at. And you know the best way of getting them from where they're at to somewhere else. Um, that's, a, that's a gutsy move, I reckon, by, um, by uh, Queensland. By, uh, no, what's it called? Finland. Not Queensland at all. <laughs> he, um, I put the link to his website on there, and I've heard him speak in person, and I thought he was he was amazing. He was at this really interesting conference in New York called the Opie Festival, which was oh, one of Salberg, yeah. and he was teaching at Harvard at the time, and he had it was kind of fun. He had like a dinner with his students every week, where they had to give up, get up, and you know, a couple would get up and give a talk at these dinners. And the three, the winners of the three best talks, the winners got to come with him to this conference in New York and talk about their, their passions related to education. So his session was not about him and about Finland. Uh, although he did talk at a, another session about Finland um, and how his role was to kind of translate what they're doing and dispel some of the myths around Finland. Um, yeah. But I loved, he was an awesome human being just because he let his students kind of take center stage and he recognized what was interesting education. The other thing I put in here too that you might find interesting to Martin is the hundred.org, which is a Finnish organization. I don't think yeah. that has anything to do with it, but they're, they're, um, they're highlighting innovation around the world and people can apply to be a fellow and things like that. And there's some really awesome examples there. You might like the website. <clears throat> yeah. I've had a look at that. It looks quite interesting. Um, you know, it's like you come away from things like this and you got another hundred links to look at. Yeah. <laughs> you think, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm really good at that. So um, yeah. my students have a couple of questions. Um, and I don't, I want to shut up and, and um, let them ask them instead of me. Laura, do you want to ask your question and say hi to Martin?
Hi, Martin. <laughs> G'day, Laura. Um, so I guess I, I was just listening to some of what you said, and um, I, I, don't, I, I don't disagree with um, just kind of the American culture in general, but, um, but I, I'm wondering why do you think we're so behind? Um, you're a bigger vehicle to move, um, but that's only my own personal perception. Um, you know, there are some fantastic things happening in, uh, in the US. And don't get me wrong, I could take you to a dozen schools in Australia which trail the US, but I could also take you to a dozen that excel and go beyond the US. I, I think we're, you know, it's not quite evenly distributed. Um, but you're a, you're a big vehicle um, to move. And it's like trying to turn around a super tanker. I thought that New South Wales was too big enough as it was. Um, but that's one of the issues, I think. Uh, I think the stress that um, politicians put on results, you know, we've got to have results. Someone once asked the question, do we value what we measure or do we measure what we value? And I think that's a very interesting thing to consider. You know, with, because someone beat someone else in a PISA test, does that necessarily mean that the education is good? Um, the work of, um, what's that guy remind me? Uh, he used to be at um, Oregon State, I think the Chinese guy. Do you remember his yes. name? Uh, Young Zhao. Young Zhao. Um, Young Zhao's work on um, comparing, you know, how well kids have gone. His conclusion is that the only commonality between success in PISA, in mathematics, I think it was, is whether or not you use chopsticks. That was the only thing that determined whether or not you were uh, going to score very well in that. And he's drawn some very interesting comparisons that show the rate of suicide in youth at the same age as PISA tests are taken. And there's almost a direct inverse correlation, which means the better you do, the more likely you are to suffer suicide. Now, there is a, you know, there's a saying in statistics that says that correlation is not causation. And just because something is correlated doesn't necessarily mean that it was caused by it. There's a, a lovely site on the, on the web about, um, the crazy correlations that you can do. And one of them is the uh, number of films that Nicolas Cage has appeared in and the number of each year and the number of swimming pool deaths in the US each year. And they're pretty closely correlated. You know, it's really interesting. And so do they mean anything? That's, the, I guess, the point. Exactly, yeah. So uh, the PISA test, too, I don't think here... It's interesting because they're the P OECD, which produces the PISA test, just announced um, a global citizenship version yeah. framework out for it, and they're piloting it. And I went to a thing at Harvard in December announcing this. And I didn't know that much about PISA. I haven't really thought about it. I'm not sure if anybody here cares about it um, that much. I mean, like, I don't know if it's a driver of, of what schools are looking at, but just so you guys know to my students, it's only 500,000 kids take it every two years. There are 15 year olds who take it. Um, so, you know, we usually rank in the middle kind of, and Finland and Singapore usually outrank everybody. Um, and the other piece of this too is I, I, the, I don't know what the math and the, the, the other assessments are like, but the global citizenship one is actually kind of an interesting assessment. They, they look at it, um, on a couple of different uh, ways. And one of them is like a teacher um, survey of, of students and that sort of thing of, of behaviors and mindsets and skills that they see in their students. So it's not necessarily a multiple choice test. Um, I think they're trying to make the, the assessments a little bit more meaningful. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this is a fairly small population of kids to, to determine whether we're really doing that well or not. I wouldn't bank all my money on it. Um, yeah, Mia, do you, go, uh, yeah. Mia, do you want to ask something too? Uh, it wasn't a question so much as just an observation. Um, it seemed like when uh, earlier the 
Finnish program was being described, it just kind of made me think of, oh, Common Core. That was kind of the intent of Common Core to make um, a situation where the skills or the curriculum was required, but then it could be implemented in the ways that was thought best. And so it was just an interesting connection that I made while listening to the conversation. Yeah, and I feel like it hasn't happened, Mia. Like, like I feel like a lot of schools have gotten prescriptive about it, and it wasn't intended to be that way. You know, don't you think? Or I mean, I'm not in a school so anymore. So, but that's the vibe I get from people I know in schools. Well, um, with my experience in um, schools, I would say that at least that's how I've tried to use Common Core but that's my own personal experience. I don't know if necessarily that's what every teacher in every school I've worked in has been doing with Common Core, but that's how I interpreted it. It could be that I was just lucky in that regard to have that opportunity. Other teachers may not have had that experience. Yeah. Yeah, our national assessment here, which predated um, the Australian curriculum is called NAPLAN and is a test that's given to year three, five, seven, and nine kids each year. So it rotates through, as it were. And it was originally designed as a diagnostic to see how kids uh, were going and what things were working and what things weren't and where holes were in their knowledge or reasoning. Um, and it's very expensive to run, but lots and lots of people in the research behind it. But all of a sudden it turned into a uh, league table for schools because they published the NAPLAN um, values. It was originally only gonna go to staff of that kid or of that class so that they could say, this kid needs help with such and such. Independently assessed national program, how did your kid go against the rest of the kids? This is where he or she had difficulty. But that's now published. You can go to myschool.edu.au and you can type in the name of the city um, anywhere in Australia and it will come up with a list of schools and say, click on the one you're interested in and it will tell you how the kids went, how much money that school was paid, how many kids they've got, how many have got... Um, English language learning difficulties, how many are indigenous? It's amazingly personal information that is given away to all of these kids. So then when a, a parent decides where are we going to send our kids, are they going to send the kids who have got an overall low NAPLAN score school or are they going to send them to the one that's got the high NAPLAN score? Now typically the high NAPLAN score school, not all the time, but sometimes is um, a school that has is already well resourced, has great teachers, that's why it's high in that plan. Or it's in a socioeconomic area which has also been linked to student success, hasn't it? That's one of the biggest deciders of student success at school is socioeconomic status of their parents. So if you move from an area with low socioeconomic status to an, where education is not valued to an area where education is valued, then that kid is naturally going to do better in a lot of instances. So now we're finding schools are starting to train kids how to do NAPLAN tests so that they can push their NAPLAN tests up higher um, to attract more um, kids because if they lose kids, they lose staffing money. Right. It's the same here. The other, yeah. you'll, you'll see schools, and I would die if my kids went to a school that did this, where they have their test data all over their walls and they're and the kids are very aware of how they're doing and they're, how they're being tracked and um i don't i just don't think it's developmentally appropriate for kids um uh that's you'll you'll see that in in low-income urban schools where they're really concerned about where how they rank and and that sort of thing within chicago public schools there's a rating system of schools so you know if your neighborhood school is a level one or a level one plus or whatever, it's, it's, I think it's absurd, but it's a way of them of, of CPS categorizing schools so that they can target the ones that need the most help, I guess. Anyway, I, I the, you guys might, I know this is off topic from staff development, but you might find, I saw this, t this thing in the New York times about how effective your school district is. I think this is the article I saw 
and I think you can plug in, I could be wrong, this may be the wrong thing, but you can plug in your school and see the amount of growth in, in your district. And I, I may be wrong on this, this might not be the right article, but I think it is. And what I found in comparing, you know, like suburban schools here in Chicago public schools was like the most growth was in, um, in, in some high performing Chicago public schools more so than this in the affluent suburbs. And so I think there's some interesting questions. I think that's what you want to see is not necessarily the achievement, uh, but the growth. I mean, some of these suburban schools, the, the growth is not that much because their kids are already coming to school well prepared and that sort of thing, I guess. Um, yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. I don't want to, I need to make sure that everybody has, um, that we, that we finished on time because I told them we, we would, we would take an hour, but, uh, and I know you probably need to get some rest too, Martin. I'm no, wondering, uh, are you doing okay? So the, the last thing I want to just, I wonder if we could close with, um, we could talk for hours about this stuff, but I'm wondering if you could give us some specific, more advice about, well, you've already given us some ideas to think about. You you know, having some choice involved with a PD and allowing for, you know, um, some autonomy in the PD and that sort of thing. What other things would you, they're gonna be designing benchmark projects at the end um, for a scenario of their choice that will support adult learning um, around ed tech. I'm wondering if there's any other tips or ideas that you would give them that, um, or places to look that might inspire some ideas. I really want them to take ideas from our speakers and apply them to their benchmark projects. That's why I'm asking you. Sure. Um, I found two things that have worked really, really well. And one is you will always have a teacher who is pretty cool at something in ed tech. It might be taking photos on their phone. It might be um, recording music on their phone. It might be uh, family history using ancestry.com. Or it might be, you know, the, they run the, the books for their business. Um, a lot of teachers do that in their part-time because their, their partner has a business, so they do the books for them. Um, some of them have got a private interest in writing or something along those lines, or they've got a football team or a soccer team or something along those lines, and they want to track their performance. So I think if you can, this, this has worked for me with kids as well. If you can hook into that, um, then that is a, a really worthwhile thing to do. When we first put one-to-one -one laptop program into our school, 10, 11 years back now, um, we made sure that every staff member had one for the first year and not the kids, just the staff and got them to do a lot of admin stuff on that, you know, answer emails, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was cool. And we had showed them how to project things on the projector because we, I said that we needed a projector in every teaching area. So we put a projector up and showed them how to project it. And they said, oh, we'll mount this to the wall. And I said, no, no, no we'll leave it on the desk. They have to hook it up each time they want to use it. And, oh, they'll never learn how to use that. So we have this huge thing in Australia. It's a little bit like your Super Bowl called the State of Origin, which is a football game. And at this stage, big televisions weren't the norm. So a lot of people would say, oh, you know, the game's on Wednesday night. It's a ride. So you're going to watch that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll go down the pub because they've got a really big screen. Wouldn't you prefer to watch it at home? Oh, yeah, but our screen's quite small. Why don't you take the projector home and project it onto the wall? Can we do that? Yeah, sure. Okay. You knew that they would solve all the problems associated with hooking their computer to the projector or that someone around them would help them and they would have a great night. And then you didn't need to worry about that anymore. Um, there's also a bunch of kids in, in anyone's class who has a particular skill set that you can modify. And a lot of it involves um, uh, ed tech. And you can modify that by saying, you know, we're doing the, I don't know, we're doing the impact of the BHP oil spill in the Florida basin uh, on a variety of uh, plant life thingamajigs, right? So you're going to do a report on this. Everyone has to do a report. That's very important. So we do a report, but why don't give the kids the option to say, we'll do it the way you want to do it in the most 
most convincing way that you can. Take a position, make it evidenced, and then do the report. And I don't care whether it's in PowerPoint or whether it's a movie or whether it's a podcast or whether it's an interview with someone or, or what it is. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just do something that suits you and how would it affect you. Um, and that works out really well and avoids that stupid report where every single one of the 26 kids in the class gets up and runs through five PowerPoint slides about some nonsense and they're all exactly the same and everyone does the slow clap at the end of it and you wasted a period and you've not really not achieved anything. So um, I think the element of play, and Gary will talk about this, I think, um, is very much underestimated. Just have a play with it, see what it does. Have a goof around. And that's what we're trying to build into our workshops is giving people the time to have a play with someone else. Let's try and let's try that. Does it work? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe try this. Um, because they can do that out of the issue, out of the place in the school. It has to be done off site. I strong strongly believe that because inevitably someone will come up to the room where you're doing this workshop and say to someone, "Look, I know you're busy, but Mrs. So and So is here." And that person will go out to see Mrs. So-and-so and then you've lost 40 minutes. So if it's somewhere else, that doesn't happen. You can tell people to turn their phones to silent and by all means check them. And if there's something important, yeah, go for your life. But bear in mind that you're off offline, you know. <laughs> Speak of the devil. Uh, you're offline. So um, um, I'm just going to message those people and say, sorry, I can't talk right now. Um, which is fabulous. You, do you yeah, it's great. It is great. Oh, I like that too. Yeah. I, I do that. I use that all the time. Thank you. iPhone. Yeah. I love my yeah. iPhone more than anything. Yeah, um, so well, I agree. If teachers were given the opportunity more often, they wouldn't be frightened as frightened to let their students do stuff. I, I've got one other story. I'm very big on yeah. stories. And that is a, a guy way, way back. who's an English teacher. This is an English teacher who doesn't believe in reading, by the way. He doesn't read. Um, but anyway, um, he wanted to do an exercise involving technology and someone told him or he saw it at a conference or something that kids could do an exercise to demonstrate understanding of a particular novel. So he came up with this idea of he wanted the kids to take a poster for the movie of a novel, identify with a character and then build a poster with their face instead of the character and also act out a scene from that movie as if they would have played it from their understanding of the character. Well, that was a brilliant suggestion, really, really clever. I said, yeah, I'll help you with that. So I helped the kids out with, you know, photoshopping their face into a poster and we had a lot of fun with that, that was great. And then anyway, I was sitting down afterwards after the kids had shown all their movies and they were really insightful. Um, and I said to him, you know, you got a minute and we'd sit down and talk about that. And he said, yeah, he said, I never want to do this again. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, did you see that last one? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it, you know, we went from one shot to another and the movie went, and fireworks came out and all sorts of stuff. And I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, did it advance the narrative or develop the character? He said, no. I said, well, that's shit then, isn't it? Tell the kid that this isn't helping at all. You don't need to know how to do that stuff. You can still evaluate what that kid has done and how this is detracting from the message that they're trying to get across, which is what English language is you know, pretty much all about. And I find that very interesting that teachers still seem to want to know, well, admittedly that was a while ago, but still teachers want to know how to do everything. I don't think it's possible. I, I think the bottom line with all of this is how often do teachers have opportunity mia's mia's got to go and i'm sure laura's got to go up too soon um yeah in the bottom line I mean. is 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 the the how often do teachers really have the opportunity to sit down and t discuss these things in depth in a relaxed atmosphere i, I think yeah. especially especially nowadays i don't know about australia but here teachers are under so much pressure uh and are so beleaguered it's more 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 from them um, that to have a leisurely collegial conversation um, is almost a luxury now, it seems like. And so I think that's an important consideration 
is uh, I, that I hope my students will take into account is kind of the feel, the vibe that you want to get off that give off at the at the event or whatever you're planning. Um, and the element of play kind of I think diffuses that adds to it too. I mean, it combining the the deep conversation with the play and the personalization, I think seems to me to be the way to go. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Martin, but I love this. Mm -hmm. Great. I learned a lot as well. It's fabulous having this discussion, Lucy, you know, yeah. it's great. Yeah, yeah. I could do this all the time. I could do this all the time. And, um, hopefully we'll see you here. Maybe you'll meet some of my students at ISTE because I know a lot of them are planning to go if you're coming yeah. here. And if my son goes to camp again, you have his room. It's yours if you want to come early or stay late. Is that um, a good thing? Yeah, it's, they're bunk beds, <laughs> not very comfortable. <laughs> no, that's cool. The room is teeny, but you know, or I can kick, you know, I can kick somebody else out and they can go sleep nah. in the yard. Nah. <laughs> we'll <laughs> we like doing that in the summer. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think it'll be a it will be a great ISTE because it's in Chicago. So um, I don't have to travel, but we'd love to have you if you if you come through. You're yeah, more than it was pretty good last time, wasn't it? Did you go to 2000? I think it was. That was last my time. very first one, and Steve yeah. Jobs was the keynote. Yeah, yeah, I could have cared less back then. I was yeah. clueless, and I didn't know what a treat it was. And I did have my ISTE bag with an apple on it until about two years ago, when I think it got moldy or something. It was this yeah. kind of rubber bag, but um, yeah, that was my first one. Oh, and the Blues Brothers opened it with Sweet Home Chicago. That was yeah. just fabulous. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, um, we'll have a good time. You're, are you, you're planning on coming, right? This year? I'm hoping to, but at this stage, I'm not going to commit. I, um, my wife, Lizzie's won a, a bursary to um, a, um, she's an, an artist, so she's won a bursary to a print workshop in Florence. Oh, so nice. I'm going to go there for two weeks with her. Oh. And the nature of the job that I'm in at the moment is that the job finishes in June, but then starts again in July. And this is so they can kick people out. It didn't work very well. So hopefully I'm not one of those. Right. And, but then when you get in, um, you, or maybe it's, a, might be the 24th of June. I can't remember now. But anyway, there's an issue as to whether or not leave is still going to be available or whether it can be continued. I can't take leave for a job that I don't have, if you know what I mean. Right, 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 right. So anyway, we're working that out. Okay. Well, I hope it works out. And Florence, two weeks in Florence sounds like amazing. So. Bloody oath. All the right. lovely science museums and Mr. Galileo and. Yeah. yeah, and the food. Oh my gosh! And the, sometime we need to catch up about um, India, about the India conference. I would love to hear more about that. I'm I'm going to be in India for another conference. Uh, I'm leaving a week from Saturday, and I'm nervous and excited and and uh, about the whole thing. It's it's not going to be, you know, it's going to be an American school, so it's not any. Oh yeah, yeah. And Gary's going to be there actually. Is that in Bombay? Yes, yes, yeah. but um, I, I haven't been to India before, so I'm nervous. It's interesting. Yeah, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. Think I hear. of your worst organized camp experience when you're at school, and that's <laughs> probably about 10% of what you're going to get. Okay, I'll be prepared then. All right, <laughs> Martin, thank you so much. Um, thanks See you so later. Much. See you, Laura. And, um, thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, for no hanging worries. with us. And um, the, the other people in the class will be um, watching this um, afterwards. So um, okay. if I can get feedback for you, I'll let you know. Okay? Okay. Good, Good night, on. everyone. Thanks, Take care. Bye-bye.